Okay. A little bit late. Uh, all right. So uh, this is a talk about 10 interesting things in Kotlin that are a little bit lesser known. Uh, it's not an intro to Kotlin. Um, so you have to have seen a little bit already. Although I will go through really quickly some, some of the common features for those in the audience that don't really know the language. So why would you want to use a language like Kotlin? The first thing, nullability is pushed into the type system. So the types know whether or not they can store null or not. In this case, the top one is a string which cannot be null, and the bottom one is a string which is nullable. Uh, it has type inference, so a lot of times you don't even have to declare the type. Uh, so this string is obviously not nullable, therefore you don't, it's redundant to specify it, you can just leave it off. Um, if you're interacting with, uh, the Java interop story is really strong. If you're interacting with Java where you have these getters and setters, Kotlin actually just exposes those as properties which you can both read and write to. Uh, the language has string interpolation, so you don't need to do a bunch of plus signs and um, dealing with building strings yourself. You can kind of just toss the variables in uh, in a much more readable way. If you're only accessing a variable directly, it's even shorter, which is awesome. Uh, types or um, local variables and fields know whether or not they're mutable as well as nullable. So in this case, I have a user which is a val, which means it's right. You can only write the value once, and then it's read only. Uh, that's not to say that the user object itself is immutable, just that you can't uh, set the user local more than once. And then if I want to do that, not only do I have to declare it var, but our IDE gives us a visual indicator uh, as to whether something is. Uh, can be written once or written multiple times. Extension functions, which are basically syntactic sugar around static methods. So I can add this super useful isTuesday method to the date class. And then if I have any date, I can call it as if it was a method on date. Uh, it's got lambdas. Uh, and it also can infer lambdas from Java interfaces, just like Java does. So execute takes a runnable. In Kotlin, I just have to use uh, a lambda. Higher order functions, uh, so this is a function that is an extension function which accepts a uh, lambda. You can see that in the signature of the argument. It takes in a function which uh, itself takes a T and then returns a Boolean. The language also has something cool called inline functions uh, where the body of this function will be inlined anywhere that you call it. Uh, and the reason this is also super useful on something like Android is that Normally, this lambda would have to allocate an anonymous class, but because the function body is inlined, you actually can um, get rid of that anonymous class altogether. So very low overhead. Um, I talked about properties earlier. So you can define classes with properties. You don't need to actually define a field, a getter, and a setter. Uh, there's a super easy shorthand for that. Plus, uh, this data modifier on the class gives you equals hash code and toString for free. There's many, many things. Uh, that make Kotlin a appealing language. Uh, and those are readily available and easy to find on the website. But what this talk is about is 10 tricks, uh, hopefully in the next 10 minutes, that are a little lesser known, a little more interesting, and just kind of show you the power and thoughtfulness of the language. All right, these are gonna, be, these are gonna go by quickly. Uh, so explosive placeholders. A lot of times when you're implementing um, new classes, new methods, whatever, and you, the IDE is doing this for you. Maybe it'll put in a comment for a to-do. This is fine. Uh, if you start using flow control with branches, uh, your IDE will actually warn you that like, hey, you're not doing anything with this else, you should eliminate it. But really what you're saying to the IDE with the to-do comment is that I intend to use this in the future. It's a lot more problematic when you actually have a function that has to return a value. So if this is a callable instead of a runnable, this actually becomes a compiler because you're not returning from this branch. In Java, you would do something like throw an exception, which you can also do in Kotlin, and that's fine. Um, but there's a shorthand syntax in Kotlin, which is basically just a function uh, that will throw an exception and also will show up in the IDE as if it were a to-do comment, so you can easily find it. OK, um, if you're writing a function, uh, a lot of times it's good to be defensive about your inputs, to validate your inputs aggressively. In Java, we would do this with you know, checking that our arguments weren't null. Maybe we have some requirement on the input that the separator, in this case, to a, a string joining function has to be more than two characters. If you're using something like Guava, there's you know, static factories that, uh, or sorry, static helper methods that can do this for you. But if you use them for things like the argument check, 
unfortunately, what you're doing when you're creating this exception message now is you, you're creating that string eagerly where 99.9% you know, .9 of the time this check is actually not going to fail and so you never needed to do that work. If we convert this to Kotlin, we no longer need the nullability checks because they're built into the type system and the compiler emits them automatically. But the standard library has functions similar to those Guava ones that look a little bit different because now we're actually passing a lambda. And this is an inline function, so it doesn't actually allocate you know, like an anonymous class. Uh, it basically desugars into the same thing that you would have otherwise written. So it's, uh, you still get laziness uh, while still getting the uh, you know, easy readability and writability of the check. There's a bunch of these for checking nullability, ones for a legal argument, ones for a legal state, uh, and ones that throw assertion error as well. Okay, um, in Java, all types derive from object uh, other than primitives. And in Kotlin, there's a similar concept with a type called any. So you have runnable and in Kotlin that extends from any. Um, there's no real distinction of primitives in the language, although there is a distinction in the bytecode. Uh, and that means that in the language, the integer type also extends from any. Uh, what's interesting is that there's an additional one of these types that's kind of everywhere, and that's the nothing type. And nothing is a type that actually extends from every type automatically. Why do we need this? Why is this useful? Um, one of the places it's useful is in uh, resolving the type of an expression. So here in uh, this expression, I'm getting a potentially null user and getting its potentially null name. Uh, and so on the left, this type is essentially a string, but it's a nullable string. And then I'm using the Elvis operator, which is basically a, a shorthand for a null check uh, to throw an illegal argument exception if that um, user is null or the name is null. The problem is that I'm assigning this to a local. So what type should the compiler infer for that local? Well, if the throw statement was special case, like it is in Java, um, then maybe it could be, uh, maybe it could figure out just to look at the left. Uh, but in this case, it's not. And so we need this nothing type because nothing extends every type. So it looks on the left and it says username. Well, that's a nullable string. And then it looks on the right and it sees throw and throw returns nothing. Nothing extends from string. So the type ends up being string. So it's a shorthand for this, but there's other uses for this nothing return type. Um, so like I said in Java, throw is special case where you can't write any statements after throw. The compiler will, will uh, produce an error. This is also true in Kotlin, but it's not special case in the compiler. And why this is awesome is because you can write a method that will, you know, throw never allows execution to continue because it never returns. Uh, and there are methods that you could write which also potentially never return. This is like a poor man's implementation of a server that just spins on a socket pulling off connections and the only way it can stop is with an, an exception. So if you wrote, you know, a run server and then wanted to print something that's, hey, the server is running, this print line statement is never gonna run because the only way that run server can exit is by throwing an exception. You can tell this, you can tell this to the compiler in the type system by saying this function returns nothing and there are no implementations of nothing so it will never return and now your code gets the same compile time benefits of you know, throw and return in that you get warned if you ever try and write statements after calling this function because it's impossible for them to run. Uh, let is another function, extension function built into the standard library. It's got a bunch of cool uses. If you, uh, if you have a val, which is nullable, and you do a null check, inside that if statement, you can then treat user as being non-null. But what if you have a variable instead of a value? So uh, another thread might come in and rewrite that value in the middle of your if block, so the compiler can't automatically allow you to assume that user is not null inside that if block, because it might change. Well, that's a really easy way to work around that, where you can do the null check in the language, and then it only reads the variable once, and then inside the block, you can use that reference as many times as you want. Uh, another advantage is that it, it only does that read once, so when you, do, when you have a value and you do a null check, every time you reference the user, you're still, you still have to look it up, even if it's, you know, if it's a field. Um, let only reads that field once, or in this case, uh, the nullable user, and then stores that in a local automatically. 
If you're writing code that is concurrent, uh, a lot of times you're dealing with volatiles, and volatiles are expensive to read and write. Let is a super easy way to just read that value once and then use it multiple times without having to uh, declare the local yourself. Uh, there's other ones of these, so uh, I'm going to those fast, but there's one called apply, there's one called run, and in Kotlin 1.1, there's one called also. Um, they act similarly, but with subtle differences, which you can look up. Uh, and another great thing about let is that you can use it with more than just variables. So if you call a method and you want to use the return value of that method multiple times, normally you have to manually put that into a named local variable and then refer to it multiple times. But the let syntax uh, allows you to use it multiple times without having to declare that local variable explicitly. Uh, Kotlin language has multi-line string literals, so where in Java you would do something like backslash n, uh, or maybe you try to make it look pretty with multiple lines. You don't have to do that in Kotlin. Uh, you can define actual multi-line string literals. The problem is, you know, in this case, you have one that's way to, the first line's way to the right, and then everything else is slammed to the left, which is kind of weird. So there's these two cool extension functions, uh, one which allows you to indent them wherever you want, uh, and it will automatically trim that for you, so you can still have a nice readable string uh, with that indent that'll automatically be kind of chopped off for you. And you have to be careful here because it will just pick the, the leftmost guy and chop off everything. Uh, and so in this case, bar and baz would have one and two spaces in front of it still. There's also a, a second one called trim margin where you can put these little uh, tick marks to define where the margin is. And multi-line strings, just like normal strings, you can still do uh, string interpolation. Okay, halfway. Um, lazy. Uh, Declaring things lazily, especially important for you know, Android. Uh, in this case, where I want to take this string, which is not exactly an expensive computation, uh, and make it lazy. The way that you would normally do this is have a nullable field, uh, and then you read, check if it's null, compute the value, and then you can use the value. Um, Colin has this built in with the lazy delegate. Uh, and so the first time you access this, it will automatically call the function. The function will produce the value. Uh, an interesting thing to note, and something that's relatively hidden with lazy, is that this actually uses double-checked locking to ensure that the lambda is only ever called once, because you might be doing something, calling out to a database, whatever, that you need to ensure only happens once, regardless if two threads happen to call it at the same time. Uh, but a lot of times, uh, you don't need that. You have your uh, desktop application's UI thread, you have Android's main thread, where you're accessing these things, and you can guarantee that there's only one thread. Uh, Lazy actually has a parameter that you can pass to it to define the locking strategy. And so you can turn this off and avoid the overhead of the locks uh, if you so choose. There's also another mode called publication where uh, it will allow multiple threads to call the lambda, but it will only use the first person that returns. Okay, if you uh, hate SysTrace and you hate JMH for their accuracy, you can fall back to diffing current time millis for a poor man's uh, measurement of time. And so normally this is kind of what you would have to do, define locals and then perform the diff. Um, with Kotlin, there's kind of a theme here. It's got a built-in function which allows you to do this in a block automatically and it will take care of measuring uh, and diffing and then returning that value. You can do these with nanos if you'd like uh, and it's super convenient for being able to add up multiple blocks that occur in you know, the same method or class or whatever. Okay, uh, Kotlin has deprecation just like Java, except you can't just slap a deprecation annotation on a method or class. It actually forces you to put in a reason, a string talking about why that function is deprecated. Uh, in the IDE, it winds up looking the same. You get the strike through to indicate uh, and also a warning when you're doing a compilation. But there's actually more to deprecation than this. There is a level which gives you multiple uh, sort of steps of deprecation. So by default, you just get you know that strike through and a polite warning. You can set this to error, which will actually produce a compile time error and will mark it red in the code, forcing your users to make a decision about what they want to do. Uh, yeah, so if you try and run a compile, this will actually fail. Beyond that, there's a level called hidden, where the function is still defined, but is entirely absent from autocomplete. You, like, it doesn't even look like the method is still there. In error, you could still resolve the method, it just wouldn't let you compile. In hidden, uh, it basically acts as if the method is not there. And so you might be wondering why you would ever need something like this. Uh, and the reason is for binary compatibility. You can keep the method 
in the class file, but prevent people from using it. Additionally, um, while deprecating things, it's super useful to kind of guide the user of how to fix their code. Uh, and so there's a thing called replacements where I can say, don't use this method, use the built-in Kotlin function. And what it'll do is actually match the argument names to the arguments in the function uh, definition. And so when I'm in my IDE that we're using and I slap an alt enter on this deprecation, it'll say, hey, you should actually replace it. And it will figure out the arguments that you're passing and do the replacement for you. Uh, it's also super great when combined with error because you know, you're, you're not preventing that person from compiling their code. So providing them with a alt enter replacement means that they can resolve it really quickly. Um, if you, for whatever reason, need to import stuff, like you're using Guava's joiner instead of Kotlin standard library one, you can specify imports as well, and then when the replacement happens, uh, you'll get imports. The last guy uh, is punching erasure in the face. Um, hopefully we all know that you can't implement the same type with multiple generics, and this is also true in Kotlin. We can't really get around this limitation of the class file format. Um, same is true for methods. You can't uh, define two methods that have the same, gen that erase to the same thing. So in this case, if we're sorting strings and lists, in the bytecode, it looks like this. And because those are the same signatures, that doesn't work. Um, the poor man's way to work around this would be to change the function names, but that's, that's not fun. Um, Kotlin actually gives us something cool here where we can change the function names in the class file, but not change them in the source file. So because its compiler has superior generic inference, it can figure out which one of these two we're calling, uh, and then in the bytecode, it'll actually replace that with the longer name, the more specific name, uh, and if you're calling from Java, you'd see those names as well. Okay, that was 17 minutes, almost 15. Um, but there's a lot of things like this in the Kotlin language that are very pragmatic, very well thought out. Um, definitely a language built by people who've experienced the pains of Java. Uh, and so if you're interested in this, I would highly encourage you to check out um, this website. There's a lot of documentation and resources for learning the language. And that was my 10 tricks. Thank you. <laughs>